Hello, and welcome to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. I'm not sure what my audio settings are. I apologize for starting the stream late today. That's why I'm still kind of getting it figured out as we get set up here. Nope, I'm just going to take these out. Um, had issues logging into our streaming service. Marie will be joining me, I believe. I just, since I started the stream late and sent the invite to her late, thought it would get things going while I waited for her to see the link and join. Uh, I'm Brandon Testers. I'm a licensed therapist, but this is not therapy for very, very, very many reasons. Uh, what this is, is just an open conversation. It's open office hour time. Uh, hi, Marie. Because I started the, the stream so late, I went live right away. So once I add you to the stream, you'll be live. Are you ready to be added? Cool. Uh, I was just starting to do the spiel, but I'll, I'll let you take over. I was just saying this is an open conversation and apologizing for starting late and all. All right. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks. You? Did you enjoy your break? Doing all right. I did. It was nice. Um, a, a trip with a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old is not relaxing per se, but it was really <laughs> enjoyable. So uh, yeah. it was nice to take a the, of course, I ended up doing some work over the week, but it was the least work I have done over a given week since I started Effective Artistry, so that was good. Okay, that's good. That's good. Glad you got some kind of break anyway. Yeah. Um, oh, hi, everybody. Um, I guess I'll introduce myself as well. And my name is Marie, and I am a coach with ex Effective Artistry. Um, I don't know what you've mentioned, Brandon, about Effective Artistry. Um, Nothing. Not yet. Okay, so it's a, a coaching and therapy practice based in Northbrook, Illinois, and for therapy clients, um, therapists at Effective Artistry can work with anybody in the state of Illinois, and for coaching, we can work with people anywhere in the world, as long as you have an internet connection. Um, and as you were saying today, they, this is not therapy hour is not therapy it's just an open conversation it's a chance for um for people to ask questions of you brandon as the the director of effective artistry questions related to mental health neurodiversity or anything else that might come up in sessions um i think that's everything yeah sounds good yeah sorry um, I did, i'm sorry to you and to everybody who had Coming back after a week, I've had a my my schedule is packed with consults today, and so I fell behind and needed to wrap something up late. But it happens. Here we are. Yeah, um, and it's good to be back with you again. Um, so today we have a topic um, which came up in our last supervision session, um, which we have weekly as coaches and therapists with you, Brandon. And I thought it was a really interesting topic and we could have talked about it for hours and hours. And that is the subject of sleep and sleep habits and um, sleep disorders and how, how sleep or lack thereof affects us and what we can do about it. Um, so we have a few questions, but if you're in, if you're joining us live and you want to take the conversation in another direction, or you have questions you'd like to ask or comments you'd like to leave, please um, just uh, engage with us in the chat and we'll, we'll keep an eye on the chat box and we'll answer your questions as we go along. So, main thing, I'll start with the list of questions we have. Um, sleep is, it's sort of mysterious, right? It's something we don't fully understand yet. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, there's many, many things that we don't really understand about, I guess that's not what you mean by understand, but yeah, lots of things we don't understand about being human, but sleep is definitely one of the, the ratio of how common and important and impactful it is to each individual's life to the knowledge we have about it seems particularly low compared to other things that we experience you know we know a lot more about the digestive system for example than about sleep and how it works and why we do it and all that doesn't mean we know nothing we just it's a mysterious thing yeah so 
what is what um is a connection then between sleep and our mental and physical health insofar as we know yeah well so just broadly whenever we're talking about health i think it's important to remind people that health is statistically informed guesswork about individual outcomes right like to say that doing x is healthy what we mean is in a large scale study or large scale observation people who did x had better outcomes than people who didn't by some significant margin but it doesn't mean that for a given individual that it is important that you need to do that exact thing right mm -hmm. uh, and i think that is particularly important to point out with sleep because i don't totally know why but it is one of the like nobody would suggest that we all should eat the same food and the same amount of food at the same times as each other. But right. for some reason with sleep, there's, there's just not that nuance in the conversation. It's we all should sleep eight hours a night or seven hours a night or eight if you're a teenager with seven or if you're adult, whatever, uh, as though that we could like universalize it. We just can't. That's not how brains and bodies work. We know that when it comes to food, we know that when it comes to physical activity, to you know, environment. Some people like things warmer or colder or sunnier or whatever. Sleep is the same. It varies. So what is the connection? It's obvious and, and evidentiary, right? Like self-evident. We, we all experience that when we sleep in certain ways, we feel better, both physically and mentally. And when we sleep in other ways, we feel worse. And it is kind of across the board. So mm -hmm there's lots of theories about why it happens the way that it does and what specific things like the different phases of sleep for example we can categorize them because the brain produces different brain waves so we can categorically say this type of sleep is different than this type of sleep because this type of sleep is alpha waves and this is beta waves but we can't say exactly why you know like what why do we need this and not that? And if I have more phase two sleep, but less REM sleep, how does that affect me and blah, blah, blah. So in other words, you know how it affects your mental and psychological and emotional well-being, and cognitive well-being. You know how it affects your state for you as an individual. You don't really need to know that much about how it affects other people, mm -hmm. but getting the right amount of it in the right ways, the right quantity and quality and timing, all these things matter makes you feel better in a kind of global way. And if you don't, it makes you feel worse in a global way, which is one of the things that's pretty unique about sleep is that it's more or less global. If, if you go without sleeping for 24 hours, there is nothing that you can do that will go as well as it would otherwise. Yeah. Everything across the board suffers where, for example, eating, if you go 24 hours without eating or go longer without eating, doesn't necessarily affect all of your systems to the same extent, right? Um, relaxing, all these other like biological functions that we do will impact some elements, but sleep does everything, including the cognitive and emotional side. So it's important to get some sleep then, but not necessarily the standard eight hours that everybody talks about. It's important to sleep in the way that your brain and body need it. and. And the trick with that, too, is that it's not just that it varies from one person to the next, although it definitely does. And we have research based, you know, scientific valid information that that supports that conclusion. It's not like a, we're not just pulling it out of thin air. We we have observed different people do better with different types of sleep, different timing of sleep, et cetera. But also for you as an individual from one day to the next, one season to the next, one year to the next, like it's going to change for you. So there's, this isn't something just like eating, right? Again, I'm going to use that. I'm going to connect it to that a lot. No one would say, well, we got to figure out what is the optimal schedule of eating for you in a day. And then you're supposed to eat the exact same thing at the exact same time and the exact same amount every day. You switch it up day to day. Sometimes you're hungry or something. It depends on what activities you do during the day. It depends on literally the weather or the amount of sunlight exposure that you have or so on and so forth. So yeah, it, I would say it's not just important to get the right kind and the right amount of sleep for you. It's also important to be able to develop your ability to observe the correlation between how you're sleeping and how you're feeling so that as things shift, you can find ways to adjust. Yeah. Um, 
I was going to ask if there are gender differences in how much sleep we need or quality of sleep we get, if, if that's been something that's been studied. That is a good question. And I would yeah. bet good money that is something that's been studied. I don't know the results of any of those studies. So I, I couldn't say. I My guess would be that if there is some like correlation between the difference that it would that it would follow hormone cycles, not just be a biological, like across the board difference. But I don't know. That's just a guess. It's a good question. We should look into it. Mm. I'm sure people have studied it. I can't imagine nobody has. I know that my sleep patterns can change in line with hormone fluctuations. Definitely. So I just wondered if, yeah, if there was a general consensus, but yeah, I mean, the, the, different. the biological differences between I mean, sex is not binary, right? It's not just mm -hmm. male or female, but we're gonna, for the sake of being able to have a conversation, refer to male and female as the like phenotypes, right? Just male yeah. and female to make it easy, and referring to biology. But it, sex, just like gender, it's not binary. There are a bunch of different options. We put arbitrary cutoff points at which we, you know, but some females have higher testosterone than some males and some males have higher estrogen and so on and so forth. So partially because of all that, the biological differences between males and females are way overemphasized just generally. But one of the things that is pretty solid is hormonal cycles, that, that there's some pretty clear, both self-evident, like experiential evidence, but also research-based evidence that females experience different cycles of like one point in the cycle versus another, their hormones will shift more significantly than men do in some kind of, that males do in some kind of repetitive pattern. Mm -hmm. um, so that when you're looking at like biological, like gender differences that you can't explain as socialization, then hormone cycles is quite often what you're really looking at. That's and, a really important point you've touched on though, socialization and the impact of that on, you know, our workloads and stress levels and the opportunity to rest, sleep and rest rests when and 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 the socialization is connected to biological you know like sexual dimorphism is an evolutionary like i don't know what the right word is here not trait but you know it is something that evolution produces in many different species the divergence of two different sexes of the species <laughs> And for reasons like we always talk about community, right? Like it's better if if we are working together, it's better if we have different strengths and different weaknesses. It's more efficient if I can cover some things that you struggle with and you can cover other things that I struggle with rather than I need to be able to cover everything and you also need to be able to cover everything. So it's just purely from a survival and evolutionary standpoint, it's good to be different. That's what neurodiversity is all about. And yeah, there are some gender, or I should say there are some sex differences, biological sex differences that might contribute to stuff like this, you know, in terms of what the male phenotype, the, the physiology is better suited for and the female physiology is better suited for that could correlate with bursts of exertion, you know, like lions, for example, male lions rest 23 hours a day on average, which I think a lot of people know, because for that hour that they're active, they do things that very few other animals can do. They have to rest all that time to conserve and have energy to do an incredible amount of stuff in one hour. And the female lionesses work more consistently, but with less peaks. So yeah, socialization and socialization comes from biology. And then we think of biology differently because of how we socialize and blah, blah, blah. It's a lot. And and ultimately, again, that's why we start with, you got to know what works for you. It's about all the advice. If we get to some advice stuff that we're going to give about sleep is starts with observation of yourself and your experience, not here's what men should do. Here's what women should do. Here's what adults should do. Here's what that stuff is out there and it's useful. Yeah you got to look at yourself. It's not so important what other males do. It's important what you experience, you know? Yeah. Um, are there common um, sleep disorders or, or questions about sleep that you encounter in your work? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I would say when talking about sleep, people tend to focus on two particular traits of sleep. One is called sleep latency, which means the period of time that passes from when you start trying to go to sleep until you fall asleep. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, sleep onset, sleep onset. Uh, the other is duration. People just look at from sleep onset to when you wake up and how much time has passed in between. So mostly when people are asking questions about sleep, it's because something's happening in one or both of those categories that they deem different from the norm and therefore have come to, to express or uh, theorize is partially at least responsible for some of the stuff they're experiencing that they don't like. And of course, usually that's also because when they were sleeping differently, they experienced things in a better, some preferable way, and then they start sleeping differently and then things get worse. And so they have personal experience of it too. So usually when I get questions, it's about that falling asleep or how long should I be sleeping? How do I fall asleep more quickly? How do I sleep longer? I also get a ton of questions about something that actually is pretty problematic in how we talk about it, which is when should I be going to bed? How do I go to bed earlier and wake up earlier as though it's better to go to bed earlier and wake up earlier, which it is sometimes for some people. And sometimes it's better because it's helpful. Like there's things you need to be doing in the morning. And so it's better to be awake for those things, but not actually better for your physiology. You do it anyway, like we do a lot of things that are worse for our bodies and brains because there's some reason to do it that way. But right. a lot of people get this idea that it's just better to wake up early for no identifiable reason. It is not, which is not supported by the research either. This, this isn't just me saying, hey, let's all be nice to ourselves and neurodiversity and whatever. The research is very clear. Different people do better with different types of sleep patterns. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Go ahead. No, please. Go ahead. Oh, I, um, one of the questions we had was, I'm a night owl and my partner is an early bird. So we feel like we're not spending enough time together. Should we try to go to bed at the same time? <laughs> well, should we try to go to bed at the same time is a uh impossible to answer question, right? Because there's so many variables. If that's the only way for you to get more time together, then when we talk about things as good or bad, we should mm. or shouldn't do them. We're, we're compressing nuance into something simple. You know, we're, we're stating that the good thing should always be done for unspecified reasons. Even if we have our reasons, we're not specifying it. It's just something that should be done. But the truth is that this is all about prioritization. Like every brain would love to notice everything. Every person would love to do everything. Obviously, it would be beneficial for us to be able to notice everything and do everything and have as much time as we want with our partners and as much time sleeping and as much time. But we're just physically constrained. We cannot do that. It, we have resources that we have to spend to do these things, and those resources are finite. So should we try to go to bed at the same time? You're weighing two different priorities against each other. Well, a lot more than two, actually. One is time together. The other is, another is the, how my body does, my body and brain does sleeping at an optimal way for me versus how theirs does sleeping at an optimal time for them compared to the shifted sleep schedule that we might have in order to create more time together. And then the other priorities that you're weighing against too is all the other stuff that you're spending your time doing instead of either sleeping or being together. What other okay. things can you cut? to get time together? And would you rather cut those things or work on changing the sleep? Would you rather cut the time together in order to sleep better and maintain all the other things? This is, especially for people with ADHD, people who come exploring executive functioning, a very common thing is, how do I do everything I'm already doing as well as I'm doing it, but also do other stuff <laughs> more and better too? Exactly, yeah. And that's not impossible, which is part of the reason that it persists. If it was obviously impossible, no one would get stuck on. We can get more efficient at things. You learn how to do something and you can do it better and faster, cheaper, you know, energy wise. But there are limits to that. You know, getting better at something is in itself a task. You have to do things to get more efficient at something. So what are you cutting out in order to start doing those things that will help you get better? 
So I don't know, should we try to go to bed at the same time? What I can say is people think that you can shift sleep patterns mm -hmm. and you can't, meaning whatever your optimal sleep pattern is, and of course varies day to day and whatever, but generally speaking, you know, you can, you can kind of, each person has some ability to sum up for themselves. I do best when I sleep about X amount during Y time of day. And when I do this before sleeping, I do better. And when I do this after waking up, I do better, blah, blah, blah. Whatever that is, it doesn't change when you force yourself to sleep differently than that. So as a very common example, there's, there's good research that, that shows this very clearly. Some people do better with a sleep uh, a sleep schedule of approximately 2 a.m. to approximately 10 a.m. as opposed to the approximately 10 or 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. that tends to be talked about as like the most preferable way of sleeping. Which, by the way, there has never been a time in human history until very recently that that would be considered a good sleep schedule. Like, Either it would be beneficial to be awake primarily during daylight, wake up with the sunrise, go down with the sunset, or in terms of neurodiversity, or to do more or less the opposite of that with some overlap, that we're awake together for some time in the evening, but then I'm awake for a good portion of the night while you're sleeping and resting for the day, and then I'm asleep for a good portion of the early day while you're resting or while you're working, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. Going to sleep two to five hours after sunset and waking up sometimes before sunrise, sometimes after, like doing it by the clock instead of the sun is just not how our bodies are wired. No, yeah. and I, I heard this recently on another podcast where they talked about how it was more common, you know, a couple of hundred years ago even to have a couple of sleeps. So you had your first sleep and your second sleep at night and you got up in between and you tootled about the house and you did stuff if you felt like it and then you went back to sleep and that was that was deemed normal considered normal but now we have this idea that we have to go to bed at a certain time and sleep eight hours through yeah um, or otherwise we've had a bad night's sleep that that i i'm vaguely aware of what you're talking about it's not something i have a ton of detailed information about but that's a, a western culture thing that it would be going to sleep shortly after sundown and then waking up and being awake for two hours in the middle of the night from 1 to 3 a.m. or whatever, and then going back mm -hmm. to sleep. Uh, even today, though, there are cultural differences in what's considered appropriate sleep patterns. There's siestas are a very commonly known example that in some cultures you wake up early, you do a bunch of stuff when it's cool in the morning in the like heat of the day everybody rests and sleeps and then when it starts to cool down in the evening you get going again yeah. which yeah because we're supposed to respond to the environment not to the concept of time which is arbitrary more or less right like not completely arbitrary we we map it to patterns that are observable you know how long it takes the sun to go around the earth and whatever it's a problem of scale that if if we're going to do something large scale, like, for example, have a school where 4,000 kids go to that school, we have to pick a time to do that for that school to be open. We can't have 4,000 kids wandering in and out whenever they want to. Actually, I think moving forward, we can and we should. I have some ideas about how schools should be handled as technology enables different things, but historically, we can't do that. And so if we can't do that, then people's work schedules have, you know, we have to be at the office at the same time in order to do our job together. We're talking about in the past, not as technology changes things. So yeah, then it became sleep all at once and be awake from when you wake up until when you go to bed. None of this is how it's supposed to be, like in terms of how our brains and bodies evolve. Another super common one for a lot of people, if you live in a part of the world that has significant changes between the seasons where you get a lot more daylight during one season and a lot less in another. You're not supposed to be doing the same stuff during that time. Like the history of our species is when there's good weather and sunlight, we do all the stuff we need to do to store up so that we can rest as much as possible when there's not a lot of sunlight and when there's bad weather. You, you sow the seeds, you grow the plants and you harvest them, and then you hole up for winter and you do your repairs and whatever, you're ready for the next season. That's the like where 
make hay while the sun shines comes from, right? That mm -hmm. phrase. Yeah. yeah. So now we talk about it as seasonal affective disorder or the winter blues or whatever different things we want to talk about. And of course, it's different for different people. I'm not trying to universalize this or take away someone's um, description of their experience, how it might be different from others. But yes, if you put me in summer and tell me what I'm supposed to do and then put me in winter and tell me that I'm supposed to do the exact same thing, it's going to be different. It's going to be harder. And we come up with our best workarounds with different ways of lighting and vitamin D supplements and et cetera, et cetera. But that's kind of back to where we were talking about. If your natural sleep schedule is to simplify 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., can you make yourself sleep from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m.? Of course you can. We all know it. We we can make ourselves sleep differently than our bodies would just do on their own if we let ourselves do whatever we wanted. But think of it like a rubber band. It's not that you've now shifted it and this is your new default. It's this is your default and that's how it would always be optimal. If we are pulling it over here, then there's some tension, meaning we have to do some things to make it stay over here. And if we don't do those things, then it's gonna snap back to where it started. So that's a big myth about sleep that I think is important for people. You can't just train yourself to sleep significantly differently than you do. Yeah. You can make changes to your life that make you sleep. And you can even make changes to your body and your brain and the way you go about things to shift that default. But then you have to do whatever things you're doing to maintain that state of your brain and body that wasn't your default way of being. And for the majority of us who have work patterns that can't be that flexible or you don't work from home or whatever this is this is a necessity right we're not going to be able to just go no i'm, I'm changing my shift i'm going to come in at 2 p.m tomorrow because i want to sleep yeah i mean necessity of course again one of those words that we want to be careful about because it's weighing priorities and mm -hmm. obviously for practical purposes yes we can just say you need to get up in in order to get to your work on time but what we really mean there is the consequences of not waking up and not getting to work on time are so much more negative for you than the consequences of sleeping at a different time and waking up earlier that it's not even worth considering. It's just such a clear imbalance of, yeah, this has negative and positives, this has negative and positives, but it's, it's not close. It's usually what we mean when we say it's necessary to do something. Yeah. So yeah, for shorthand purposes, but sleep needs nuance like yes but yeah i have young kids i don't i sleep best 2 a.m to 10 a.m i don't sleep that way i i get up lately my wife has been helping me to be able to sleep until like seven or eight but prior to a month or two ago i've been waking up at six o'clock or earlier for two years three years i don't know long time I don't like it. It's not as good. Last night, I didn't fall asleep until 1.30, even though I was tired. It's just, it's difficult to fall asleep. There are things I can do to make it easier or more likely, but it's going to keep snapping back to that. And there are times that you just got to go do what you got to do. Yeah. Just don't confuse that with, it's better to do it that way. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, so you mentioned that a lot of clients come in with issues. Um, or they're noticing it's taking them a while to fall asleep at night. Um, yeah. So what kind of things would you suggest people change if they're trying to fall asleep faster or if their quality of sleep isn't as good as they would like it to be? What kind of things or where would you start with a client who's having issues with sleep? So any client that's having issues with anything where I'm always going to start is let's get more information. Let's start with observation. Let's start getting data that you haven't previously gotten, because if you've gotten it in the past already, it's possible that I might have some thoughts about what to do differently about it than what you've already thought of or been told. It's, but it's less likely, right? Like you've been trying things. So it's much more efficient for us to get new data that you haven't been paying attention to because it is going to be individualized, right? So common examples. Uh, people with ADHD, this is what the research says, on average, in eight hours of between falling asleep and waking up, spend 90 minutes of that time awake. Whereas people who are not diagnosed with ADHD 
spend a little less than 60 minutes of that time awake, which by the way, nobody thinks about. Nobody mm -hmm. thinks, oh yes, in the eight hours of sleep I got, I was actually awake for an hour of it, but pretty much everybody is. Uh, and research also, so like a, a common like holistic supplement that's suggested for people who have problem sleeping is L-theanine, uh, which the research shows does not actually have any significant impact on sleep, except for one study which showed that in ADHD, males diagnosed with ADHD age 12, that it decreased that awake time from 90 minutes to 60 minutes that taking a significant portion of uh, what, you know, like whatever dose of L-theanine was recommended helped them to sleep more of that time that they were asleep. That's so, pretty specific. Right. And does that mean that all ADHD people might? Yeah, it could. It just, that's the study that they did. It was with 12 year olds. Could it be that it's 12 year olds? Could it be that it's males? Could it be uh, this, the limitations of research? But generally speaking, anything that you've heard suggested to you is probably beneficial to somebody's ability to fall asleep. Just doesn't mean it's yours. So what I would suggest, whenever I'm working with a client, I always wanna explore patterns of sensitivity, meaning hypersensitivity. The way that we talk about that here at Effective Artistry is our brains have processes by which they dictate what things are worth bringing into conscious awareness and what things aren't. Which by the way, just to be clear, doesn't mean it's saying this has no value to notice. It just means of all the stuff that I could notice, I'm ranking it and I notice as much of that stuff as I can before I run out of room and everything below that doesn't get noticed. I would still like to. So we have our different, there's some patterns in those processes that are relatively universal and some that are individual. Sensitivities is one way of talking about that. Meaning if for some reason you notice a pattern that your brain admits into conscious awareness, a type of data more than seems useful to you, which is guesswork, but you notice something in ways that don't seem useful or even notice something to the extent that it causes problems for you, then we would call that a hypersensitivity. If you notice some category of data at a rate that is less than would seem useful to you, that it, you, seem, you think it would be more useful to you if you noticed it more, then we would call that a hyposensitivity. Right. So auditory hypersensitivity, is the most common example that people talk about. And yeah, if if small little noise cause you great distress, that's your brain admitting that information into awareness greater than seems to be useful. Also means that you're likely to be able to do things that require that kind of information, like nuance and granularity and detail of that type of information. You have some ability to engage with those things in a way that you wouldn't if you brought that information in at some lower level. Yeah visual artists are tend to be sensitive to visual data and that means that things like clutter or things like contrasting patterns that are harsh whatever might bother them more than it bothers other people musicians are more likely to be sensitive to auditory data yeah. which means that they're more likely to be uh, stressed out in a situation like a restaurant where they're sitting in the middle of a bunch of different people having conversations at different tables so there's upsides and downsides. We want to look at sensitivities because here's what you want for sleep. Your body needs to be relatively still and your brain needs to be occupied. Those are pretty much universal. If your brain is not occupied, if your mind, your conscious thought is not occupied, it will come up with some stuff to start thinking about. We experience this all day long, right? If I, if I'm, I don't know, if I'm doing a puzzle, if that's what I'm focused on, seems valuable or worth doing, and I'm paying attention to that data, I don't have room left over to be paying attention to, oh, someday my parents are going to die. That's going to be off, you know. But if I don't have anything in front of me, we call that boredom, right? Like I don't have anything that seems worth paying attention to. The brain doesn't shut off. You don't just go unconscious when there's nothing important or valuable in front of you it starts coming up, oh, great, we have some space, so let's go further down that list and start thinking about some of the stuff that we don't usually get to think about. And sometimes that's awesome. Sometimes it's thinking about cool, fun stuff or great memories or whatever. And sometimes it's terrible. And you're thinking about what horrible things might happen to you, even if they're not realistic at all or whatever. 
So at night, in an environment, uh, an environment in which you have most likely, most of us have done everything that we can do to make it physically comfortable as possible, which means the whole point of what comfort is, is that there's not a lot in the environment that's drawing our attention. Comfort means I don't notice it. This chair is comfortable. I don't notice it. Yeah. If it's uncomfortable, it's because I'm noticing something that needs to be addressed. So we specifically do this thing because our bodies do need to be comfortable. If you're in a dangerous situation, your body's not really going to go to sleep very well because it shouldn't. It's not safe. So we're basically trying to convince our bodies that everything is safe and it's OK to just shut down a little bit. Not all the way, because even when you're asleep, you can be woken up by a noise or a jostle or whatever. We don't shut down all the way, but we shut down to a point that we become much more vulnerable to things in the environment. So we want it to be safe and comfortable. But the flip side of that is that then the brain doesn't have anything pressing. The mind doesn't have anything pressing to focus on. And so it just starts running whatever the hell it starts running, which in essence, by the way, is part of what dreaming is. Of course, there's a lot of different theories about it, but obviously the brain, the mind, whatever element of it is conscious and we can remember whatever is spending resources on stuff that is generally speaking, not relevant to our normal life, not stuff that we would spend a lot of resources considering during the day. So you need to occupy that, but you need to occupy it in a way that doesn't keep you awake. This is a lot. I always explain my reasoning because each individual is going to be different. Yeah. But the conclusion is you need to give yourself something that is interesting to you, but not so interesting that it energizes you, just interesting enough that it occupies you. Preferably something that requires zero movement, zero physical or as close to zero as possible, and preferably something that can be interrupted at any point without negative consequences. Mm -hmm. TV shows, the problem with watching a TV show at night is if I start to fall asleep, I get that window of like, oh, you know, there's my eyes starting to close but there's only five minutes left in this episode. I just want to finish it. So let me stay awake. And then by the end of the episode, I missed that window because falling asleep is a very complex process. A lot of different systems all need to shut down, you know, make significant changes in specific order and relationship with each other. So that's why we all have this experience of windows, right? Where it's like, yep, if I let myself, I could fall asleep right now. And then other times where it's like, no matter how much I want to, I can't just fall asleep right now. I can try and set up the conditions that will get me to a point where I can fall asleep. Hmm. So reading a book is a common one and a good one because when you stop reading, when you get tired, you can just fall asleep and it, you don't miss anything. There's no incentive to stay awake for the most part. If you're reading books that, that you're like, no, I want to finish this, then you're going to have a harder time falling asleep. So look at your sensitivities. One of that is senses, right? Auditory, olfactory, smell, gustatory, taste, visual, tactile, kinesthetic. And give it some data that is not novel. So yeah. if you have an auditory sensitivity, a white noise machine can be great because it's not so repetitive that your brain can start to tune it out and say, yep, I've gotten this, I know exactly how it goes. Like if you put the same song on repeat sooner or later, the brain's gonna say, yeah, I don't need to pay attention to this, I know exactly how it goes. So it's complex enough to keep it there, but also repetitive enough, unimportant enough that you're not incentivized to stay awake to see what happens next in the white noise machine. If you're sensitive to smell, Look at scent diffusers, you know, there's a reason I forget what the ones are, but it's lavender that's often considered to be like a relaxation smell. Relaxing, yeah. yeah. If you're sensitive to taste, chamomile tea or peppermint tea or brushing your teeth with mint. Like some of these things have natural associations with restfulness. Some of them are just meanings that we create that, oh, when I drink my tea, that's right before I go to sleep. And so I start to build a correlation like you know, like Pavlov, it's called operant. Yeah. I'm sorry, not operant conditioning, it's classic conditioning. Uh, so lean into that stuff, including, yes, TV shows. This idea that screens keep you awake. First of all, already we have research coming out that's suggesting that even the blue light theory stuff was wrong. 
Oh, wow. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, because all this stuff is just theories and we test it and we don't really, we can't isolate the variable. This isn't like physics where we can determine the variables and potentially isolate them given the proper equipment and whatever. Mm. Human behavior, you cannot isolate variables from other variables. So we're just making our guesses. Mm. It's a theory that makes sense. Blue light wakes you up because that's when the sun's in the sky and red light puts you to sleep because that's when the sun's going down. It makes sense and they ran some studies and they got some results that showed then other people thought no that doesn't make sense some studies and got results that say nope it's bogus either way if it keeps you awake then it keeps you awake if it helps you go to sleep my wife stresses out at night right like when her mind is unoccupied she'll often start thinking about things that aren't really important or relevant i will sometimes stress out at night thinking about things that aren't even real like you know, you fall kind of half asleep and then wake up 40 minutes later and I'm stressed about something from the dream that it has no basis in reality. It literally could not matter. And I'm still like, oh God, what if blah, 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 blah. Uh-huh. So for her, we watch, we, we jokingly call it, I saw someone tweet about it, same shows. Yes. Same shows. Yeah. Like in the autistic community, same food refers to, these are the foods I know that work for me. There are very few, but they, you know, same shows for her. She has, I don't know, six to eight different shows that she just rotates through and needs to watch an episode or two before going to bed because then her mind is occupied by the show and can't jump onto some other thing. It's effectively the same as what stimming is. We yeah. just want stims at night that don't require a lot of movement. So there's a difference between a screen where you're scrolling and mm -hmm. interacting and making decisions and having to think and do stuff versus a screen where you're just passively observing. They're not the same. Yeah. I have same shows. I call them my comfort shows. Mm -hmm. And if my mind is racing at night, I'll stick on a comfort show. It's usually a comedy, 25 minutes, and it's enough to get me to unwind. I'm glad you've mentioned this because this was something I suggested to a client as well, um, because they like to watch TV when they're going to sleep at night. but if it's something they haven't watched before, it's gonna keep them awake. So yeah. they switch to watching same shows and now they can fall asleep with the TV on. It's just this dim. Like we, we use different language for it, but decades, for decades, people have said, oh, I put the TV on because I like to have noise. A very common thing. I grew up in a big family, so I like to have the TV on because I like to have some background noise, which is a, I mean, a viable narrative Obviously we can't like actually draw that conclusion with any like scientific data, but it makes sense. It's just a stim. It's just, yeah. I need a certain type of data that occupies enough of my attention and enough of my brain to decrease the intensity of some other experience. If my entire mind is focused on a particular memory, we call that a flashback. The memory becomes everything. So I don't want my entire mind there. I want some of my mind on the present moment, the present physical environment, so I can engage with the memory without going into it completely. And that's why stimming is when you're incredibly angry and when you're incredibly excited. It doesn't matter if the experience that you're having is a pleasurable or unpleasant one. If it's too intense, stimming is what we do to decrease that intensity. And so if your mind is racing at night, you gotta give it some stuff. Yeah. And again, you don't have to do it because it might just be that when your mind has nothing else to think about, it starts thinking about cool story ideas that you could work on, or it starts thinking about like what would be fun to do tomorrow or whatever. And that works. But if it doesn't, if you start thinking about stressful things, then you want to take control of what you're offering to your mind to occupy it instead of just letting it choose randomly. Mm. I mean, it's not random, but to us. I know some people like to keep a notebook by the bed. So if they're having those big stressful thoughts or the what ifs, they can just sit up in bed, grab a pencil, write it in the notebook and get it out of their head. Yeah. And then they can come back to it the next day and that can help them fall asleep. Yeah. Well, so some of the things that we do have some good knowledge about what happens during sleep, although again, we can't quite suss out phases and whatever is that's primarily when the body is doing like repairs because yeah. just like traffic, right? In order to repair a system, the system has to be out of use for a while. If you're using it, you can't also be repairing it. So we heal, we grow, 
like physically heal and grow mostly when we're asleep when you're sick or injured there's a reason you're sleeping more you need more time and more resources dedicated to repairing things and doing things so you can't be using those systems same thing with brain fog right is the system either is damaged to the point where the best it can do is what you're calling the state of brain fog or you haven't had enough time to do repairs and therefore some repair is needing to happen and it could be that both is true at the same time mm -hmm. in terms of what's happening cognitively that's we don't quite have the same information but we have some information that suggests and of course reason that would suggest that the same kind of thing is happening that that's when changes are being made to the brain in other words that's when like long-term memories are getting encoded into the hardware of your brain the the fundamental difference between a short-term memory which is something that you have to maintain the meanings and the connections because it doesn't exist physically versus a long-term memory which is when those physical connections are made happens at night so some general things before we wrap up because I want to get some, you know, actionable stuff. Here's what I recommend to people is some way of organizing information from the day. Journaling, talking, like there's a reason that spouses will frequently at the end of the day say, well, tell me about your day. How was your day? We, we want to organize that. Inf it's all in there floating around, but the more we can link it up and make connections to it, the easier it is to kind of process it and let it go. So doing some activity that helps you organize information from the day. One thing that I like that's very quick and easy is um, I'll have my kids and my wife and I, what are three things that happened today that I liked, which is something that helps organize information, but also has this other thing of we prioritize negative information. So we disproportionately remember negative things. We have to put effort into remembering to, we have to effortfully think about and therefore encode into memory positive things. So I'm kind of trying to kill two birds with one stone there. A lot of people pray or meditate at night, which are both, I think, fundamentally, whatever other things they may or may not be, it is also definitely a way of organizing information, kind of organizing your energies and your intentions, mm -hmm. journaling, etc. So some activity to do that, to organize your information from the day. Then some ritual of transitioning from awake time into sleep time. And again, very common ones are taking a shower, washing your face, you know, brushing your teeth, switching into your pajamas, taking out your contacts, whatever. Very, very simple things that we all do it, not we all, but many, if not most of us do at night. That is some kind of physical transition, including, for example, going to bed. There's a reason that it's harder to fall asleep if you work in your bed and sleep in your bed. The environmental cues are different they're interpreted differently your body's getting confused it is going to, if you are wearing the same clothes all day that you're sleeping in at night it you're you're foregoing the opportunity to have some external cues to your body that it is time to start shutting down yeah. so some ritual that is a transition a physical transition from wakefulness to sleep to indicate to the body that it's time to shut down and there's tons of common ones there and then once you're in bed something to occupy your brain something that it will pay attention to so rely heavily on sensitivities but isn't important doesn't require interaction or decision making or movement at least to the best of your ability and can be stopped at any point and picked up later on without any loss of anything so yeah this will come out to common advice of you should journal then meditate then wash your face get in your pjs get in bed and read a book till you fall asleep which is a pattern that helps many 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 people mm -hmm but adapt it to your sensitivities. Yeah. If you, if your mind is racing, reading is great or watching shows is great because it's giving you something to think about. If, if your eyes are just looking around constantly, you're seeing faces in the dark and whatever, then either try an eye mask that blocks your ability to do that, or they have these great, like more or less lava lamp kind of things that project up onto the ceiling that you can just kind of watch the lights move this is great for kids by the way lava lamps there's a reason we think of those things as so ooh, hypnotic and soothing yeah. it's unpredictable movement so there's reason for our brains to focus on it but not important it's within certain constraints so we don't tune it out quite as easily as we would if it would just cycle but it also we don't have to keep paying attention to it sense taste touch look at like the bed that you're sleeping on, the pillows that you use, 
the sheets and the blankets, the temperature of the room that you're in, all of these things you can change and will help you. What you're wearing or not wearing. I sleep in the nude. I hope that's not crass to say to people. I get very, I have tactile sensitivity. There's a reason that my fidgets are so kinesthetic, right? So when I like roll over in bed at night and my sheets bunch up and my clothes bunch up, it makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Track your sleep if you can. They have apps that do it without any external, you don't need a watch or a ring or whatever, but of course there are watches and rings and even more precise data. But then you start to make correlations. Oh, when I do this, there's this. Some common things just to run through quickly. But again, everyone is different. No, especially if you have ADHD, it's very common for people with ADHD to eat a bunch of sugar at night and then that knocks them out or drink caffeine at night and that knocks them out. So everyone is different. Don't take this as this is how it should be. But common things are not eating for the two or three hours prior to going to sleep. Uh, there do seem to be strong correlations between alertness and waking up. If you're like one of those people that wakes up very slowly and foggy, and whatever, physical activity in the previous day seems mm -hmm. to correlate to alertness the following day. Oh, correlations, not direct causation or anything like that. Um, setting intentions for the following day. So organizing thoughts from that day but also organizing intentions for the following day. Tomorrow I'm gonna to X, Y, and Z. It's useful. Lean on the people around you. You know that if somebody else is gonna be awake before you, use that. It's not something to feel guilty about. If you're gonna be awake later than them, use that, right? To the extent that you can. Uh, but mostly just pay attention. And I'll say this, in terms of neurodiversity, the concept of neurodiversity is that our species does better when our communities contain individuals which are diverse, right? That some of us are built this way, which enables us to do these things very efficiently, even though it also makes us do these things very inefficiently. And some of us are built this way, which does the reverse. Some of us are tall and some of us are short and we're better suited for different things, right? Well, sleep is one of those things. Yeah. Early bird and night owl, we have research not that we need it, it's obvious, everyone experiences this, but we do have research that shows that people are wired differently, that some of us do better with sleeping later, others do better earlier. The classic example of neurodiversity is auditory sensitivity. That's like the textbook example is, it's beneficial to a community to have one individual whose hearing is so sensitive that they hear predators coming from three times farther away, even if the trade-off for that is that their hearing is so sensitive that it makes it difficult or unable for them to do other routine tasks. The rest of the community takes care of that and that person listens for predators. Well, another one is it's better for the community if some of us are awake during the day and some of us are awake during the night. Most of us awake during the day and a smaller percentage of us awake during the night. There is a large correlation between an ADHD diagnosis and an optimal sleep pattern of 2 a.m. to 10 a.m because if we explore this enough, what are the people doing when they're up at night and you can't be doing all that you're talking? Like the, the, the classic image of cavemen around the fire telling stories, creating art, like that's when it's more about cognitive tasks than physical. Not necessarily right. that's why, but there's a reason some of us, our minds race at night, and that's when we get energized. We're exhausted at 6, and then at 10 p.m., we just want to talk to everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. It is hardwired into you. It doesn't mean you have to do it. Just there are reasons for it. So anyway, lots and lots of things that can be explored, but it should all be individualized. Come up with your theory. Come up with a way to test it. Test it. See what happens. Yeah. So this is something that we can do with clients in coaching or therapy sessions is yeah not only the data discuss the data see what's happening that's all we do whatever it is we're talking about is just let's get some data come up with some theories about how to utilize that data design an intervention to test those theories and implement the intervention and if the test goes the way we are hoping it will cool we came up with a solution if it doesn't cool we got new information and we can try something else instead of doing what everyone always does and go back to no nope, I, I really need to just make a schedule mm. Like that's not how it works for everybody. Yeah. There are other ways to accomplish the things that a schedule can do for you. You don't have yeah. to go to sleep at 10 a.m. or at 10 p.m. 
unless there's some reason that you have to, but you got to identify those reasons. Yeah. Anyway. Well, as somebody who's got a weird sleep pattern, I really appreciate this conversation. Yeah, um, and I, really, we could talk about this more. There's so, this is one of those things where I have a million practical examples, like do this thing, but it's all gated behind such long decision trees of how do you respond to this versus this and this versus this and this versus this. And then we can kind of get to a conclusion and say, okay, try this. And of course we could just randomly say, here's a bunch of things that might work like we're doing there, but I, I don't like to random. I want to give the reasoning. So it makes me, so people have a reason to think maybe I should try Jasmine instead of just saying all those people or lavender, whatever, instead of all those people who say lavender works are just, it's the, um, placebo effect or whatever. No, different things work for different people. It doesn't have to work for you to work for them. And also that helps us to stop dismissing, oh, they swear by this tea, but now that's woo woo. Ah, try it. Maybe it'll work for you too. They wouldn't yeah. say that it worked if it didn't work for them. Placebo effect is not a thing, just so that everybody knows. It's only a thing in large scale studies. It's not a thing in an individual. It's a, it's a concept that is relevant to data analysis not a person's experience that you don't have to know why something impacts a person the way that it does for it to be considered valid. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know why, then it's just placebo and that's made up. No, it, you just don't know why. And maybe yeah. they don't either. But if it works for some people, it might work for you too. The more you have in common with them, the more it's worth trying. Yeah. But if it doesn't work, try something else. Yeah. Just try something else. Don't worry. There's always other options. Yeah. Infinite options. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Of course, I'm running late to my next thing. It's good to be with you. And thank you for being here. Good to be with you too. And I'll catch up with you next week. Um, for anybody in the chat, we will um, re-upload this to YouTube. So it'll it'll be on YouTube on our streaming pay, uh, streaming section, and it will be in the recordings and the This Is Not Therapy our playlist on Wednesday. So catch you all again Thanks, next week. Marie. Take care. Bye bye.